Ну, может быть, не три, не два, не помню. Все нормально? Все нормально? Спокойно. Все хорошо. construction except that it presents a different puzzle that is something of a mirror image of the puzzle that I uh, found so intriguing with the uh, MENT construction. So um, I stumbled across this construction uh, as pretty much any other uh, non-native uh, speaker of English. I saw this and I was intrigued by it because I thought, well, this is unusual. This is something that I've never seen before and I want to know more about it. So let me give you a few examples of this. Um, this uh, construction you may have seen uh, used, for instance, with time nouns. Um, so <coughs> examples like many a day will pass, and this construction is properly understood. Or I've, I've thought that many a time myself. Yeah? So those are kind of idiomatic uh, sequences, uh, strings where many occurs with an indefinite determiner, and a time noun such as day or year or month or even time itself. Um, now, if the construction would only occur with time nouns, it wouldn't be so uh, it wouldn't be so puzzling. Yeah? But it also occurs with uh, human being nouns uh, such as father or voter. Yeah? Um, so many a father resisting education for a daughter, or many a labor voter is not happy with the outcome. So here we have a noun that describes a human being in a certain social role. <clears throat> and you also find um, more general human being nouns like man, woman, husband, wife, um, <clears throat> brother, sister, and so on and so forth. Um, so the construction is clearly more broad than just uh, occurring with time nouns. And to make matters uh, even more confusing, there are nouns that don't seem to belong into either category that you could um, make up. So here, this is an authentic example from, um, from the internet, where a blogger writes that during my time in Australia, I enjoyed many a sausage roll for brekkie. Brekkie, that's Australian for breakfast. And apparently what you eat for breakfast is uh, rolls with sausage baked into them. It's very tasty, I can recommend it. Um, but nonetheless, sausages don't have anything to do with time or with the roles of human beings. So my question really was, um, why can people say things like many a sausage roll? Yeah? Where does the sausage come from? Uh, and <clears throat> well, uh, my state of, of being puzzled was actually uh, compounded by the fact that this construction is super infrequent. Yeah? Uh, so if you haven't come across it as a second language learner of English, that's not your fault. It's because it's really, really, really rare. Yeah? You don't see it 
a lot. And when you see it, you see it in context where, um, well, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that later. So, but um, what this means is that uh, many a noun is um, sort of the mirror image of the meant construction because even though it's very, very, very infrequent, it's still highly productive. Yeah? With meant, we had lots of types. Those types are reasonably frequent. We see many hapexes. And still, the construction as such is not productive. It's not used to create new types. And here, we have the opposite. We have a construction that occurs almost never. But still, speakers uh, construct new uh, expressions on the basis of that construction. So what we would expect normally when a construction does this in terms of frequency is that it recedes into uh, a few idiomatic phrases where you can say it. Yeah? So let's say it, uh, you, you can say it with time and with day and, and that's about it. Yeah? That would be a natural behavior, so to speak, something becoming more and more idiomatic, more and more restricted. But here, we see it becoming less and less frequent, but still, the productivity stays high. I wanted to know why is this and uh, what happened with this construction. Yeah? So, um, in particular, I wanted to find out what happens to the semantic spectrum of the nouns that we find in the construction. So, why can speakers say uh, silly things like many a sausage roll? Um, what is up with the semantic development in the construction? So I uh, looked at data not from the Oxford uh, English Dictionary this time, but from a proper historical corpus, uh, the COHA corpus. It's the uh, Corpus of Historical American English, um, which holds data from the 1800s to the 2000s, 2000s in uh, decades. So. Um, <clears throat> I extracted from that corpus all sequences of the quantifier many, then a form of the indefinite article, either a or an, and then um, leaving, leaving space for um, <clears throat> up to three elements between the determiner and the final element, namely a noun. Um, so that gave me lots and lots <coughs> of examples that I then uh, sorted into types, yeah? so after the noun. Um, so <clears throat> what that gave me was a large table of about uh, 15,000 tokens of the construction. So the core is a large corpus, so even with an infrequent construction, we find lots of examples for it. And these 15,000 tokens break down into about 3,000 different noun types. So. Uh, this is a table that's ordered by frequency, so the most frequent noun is time, then day, man, year, hour, night, heart, and so on and so forth. You can't read this from, from the back, but um, this, is, um, this is what it is. Yeah? Uh, and so about 3,000 types of this table goes on for at least uh, two or three stories in this building. Um, but I only used uh, the 230 most frequent nouns in the data. And uh, I'll explain and motivate and defend this choice why in this case I focused on only uh, the most frequent nouns that are found with this construction. Um, so even though I'm using only less than 10% of all the types, uh, notice that I'm using still more than 60% of all the tokens, so the majority of the <coughs> data is still in the analysis. Okay, and uh, for these uh, 230 most frequent types, I used um, distributional semantics, the methods of distributional semantics, to create a semantic vector space um, on the basis of synchronic corpus data. So I took all those nouns <coughs> and uh, used a different corpus, um, the corpus of, um, <coughs> it's called the, the, the COCA, um, so that represents uh, synchronic current uh, American English. And I uh, analyzed these data with regard to relative similarities between them. And um, I know that some of you have a background in computational linguistics and know about distributional methods. Uh, if you do, uh, bear with me. But for those who are not familiar with this, I prepared a few slides to explain uh, what it is that I did. 
Okay. Uh, so stop me if this is too trivial. Um, otherwise, <clears throat> I can I can speed things up. So how does uh, distributional uh, semantics work? Um, on this slide, you see uh, different words that describe things that could be found uh, on a farm. Yeah. So uh, there can be pigs and cows and uh, there can be a mouse or uh, carrots can be grown on the farm and so on and so forth. And uh, all of these words are related in some way, but some are more closely related uh, than others. So if you were to give these words to, uh, let's say, an eight-year-old who is familiar uh, with these words in English, uh, they would probably um, group them into three different categories, yeah? so that we have uh, one group of vegetable words, yeah? uh, carrots, potatoes, cabbage, and so on and so forth. Then we have one group of <coughs> uh, clothing items, so hat, shirt, boots, and so on and so forth. And then we have the animals, cat, pig, mouse, and so on. Um, right, so this is what a human would do. Um, here you see a picture that was not created by a human being, but that rather resulted from a computer categorizing uh, these nouns in terms of their meaning. Yeah? And what you see is that the computer arrives at a sorting that reflects very much our intuitions <coughs> as uh, language users. So what we see is that there are um, different groups. Yeah? We see a group of clothing items, we see a group of animals, and up there we see a cluster of uh, vegetables. <clears throat> so clearly the computer picks up on some aspects of meaning. The computer even picks up on aspects of meaning that uh, I disregarded in my uh, last slide, namely the fact that corn and wheat aren't really great vegetables. Yeah? So the computer knows that, apparently, and said, well, look, these are not vegetables. These are some things of their own. They are called grains. Human, yeah? Um, so this is how they two end up there. And uh, in the next uh, five or so minutes, I just want to briefly uh, explain how this automatic positioning and semantic space works and what work steps are involved in the process. So um, the first work step in such a procedure is that uh, we choose a vocabulary of keywords and then retrieve frequencies of context items uh, from a corpus. So uh, in the example that I have shown, uh, the vocabulary is actually the set of uh, farm words. <clears throat> and um, I'm, a, I'm a speaker of German. So in my native language, there is a word for vocabulary. Uh, it's Wortschatz, treasure of words. And so this is how you see the, the, the treasure chest there. So uh, this is where we put all our vocabulary. Yeah? So all the words that we want to analyze go into the Wortschatz. And that is what we're uh, working with now. So once we have the Wortschatz or the vocabulary, we uh, can take elements out of the Wortschatz and search for them in the corpus. Yeah? So all of you have done this, I suppose. So if we search. Uh, the word goat in a corpus, uh, we get as a result a concordance that is a keyword with context items to the left and right. Um, so authentic uses of the word goat in context. Um, the first step that is done usually is that grammatical words and high frequency words are removed from the concordance. So these are uh, uh, stop words, words that are Frequent <clears throat> words that are from grammatical categories such as determiners, conjunctions, um, <clears throat> uh, determiners or demonstratives, um, auxiliary verbs. So all of those are gone and all that is left are the meaningful content items that are found to the left and right of our keyword. <clears throat> so. Um, that is the, the, the context that defines or that uh, lets us uh, characterize the word goat. And now all of these context items, the stuff that we find to the left and right of goat, uh, these are put uh, in a bag of words. Yeah? So it's called a bag of words because there's no 
uh, longer any order to the words. They're just collected. Uh, and um, yeah, so <clears throat> the, any syntactic information, anything uh, like the sequence of certain items, uh, all of that is removed. But this is now the bag of words that represents the context of GOAT. Yeah? And one rather uh, convenient characteristic of these um, bags of words is that we can make a frequency list out of them. So here we have the uh, <clears throat> context of GOAT and uh, we see that the frequent, most frequent uh, collocates of GOAT that we find in the left and right context are mountain, so apparently there was a text about mountain goats. Um, nouns typically like to co-occur with themselves. Yeah, that's not a mistake, that's actually a feature that happens. Um, <coughs> milk, cheese, okay. Uh, sheep, meat, horns, antibodies, so some medical text were in, in here. Uh, black, and a few others. Yeah. And um, tiger. And a tiger. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know if the goats were attacked by the tiger or if there was anything else. Um, but there's a tiger. <coughs> okay. Um, so these frequency lists then are the basic information that the computer works with. This is a representation of a goat as a lexical element. And um, of course we also get frequency lists for all the other elements of our vocabulary. So here's the frequency list for, for cow, uh, here's one for pig, and here's one for trousers, which was one of the uh, clothing items that I had. <clears throat> and the reasoning goes that words uh, that are semantically similar, or are semantically related in some way, they should have similar frequency lists. So, um, well, for, for goat and cow, we have milk. Yeah? So that's one semantic feature that, that goats and cows have in common. Um, <clears throat> there are also things that pigs and cows have in common. So we have meat for the cows, we have meat for the pigs, um, and so on and so forth. And because goats, cows, and pigs are animals and trousers are clothing items, we would expect that these three frequency lists have on average more in common than, uh, than let's say, this one and this one. Yeah, um, that is the basic material um, that lies at the heart of distributional semantic analysis. So um, the first work step then is that we choose a vocabulary of keywords and we retrieve frequencies of context items from a corpus. We have the vouchers and we have bags of words that represent the context of the items in our vouchers. Um, then the next step is simply um, yeah, a, a different arrangement of these uh, word lists such that we have a table of frequencies with vocabulary items in the columns and context items in the rows uh, or the other way around, but you have to choose one. Um, let me quickly show how this works. So we have the vocabulary items, goat, cow, pig, and whatever else we want to include. and then. We have all context items, and then we can fill the cells in the table with the actual co-occurrence frequencies. Yeah. So if, uh, let's say, we find the word cat in the context of goat exactly once, we have to put a one into that cell. Uh, you notice that uh, <coughs> we find the word cheese 20 times in the context of goat, which might indicate that goat cheese is actually a thing, yeah? that this is something uh, specific semantically for goats, but not for cows and not for pigs. Right. Uh, you also see that uh, some elements are, some cells are zero. So in this data set, the cow, uh, there was no adjective gray in the context of cow. Even though there are gray cows, I've seen them. Yeah. In this corpus, there were not. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, now, once, once we have a table like that, um, a computer can actually compare um, the frequency lists for different vocabulary items. So we can look, um, okay, how often does goat occur with cat? How often does cow occur with cat? Is there a difference? Yeah? And we can add up these differences um, so that um, the absolute differences between 
let's say, uh, 20 and 4, 8 and 8, 1 and 0, 1 and 1, uh, is added up. And uh, this is <coughs> uh, thought, then, to reflect a kind of semantic difference. If we have very different frequencies in here, yeah, that should mean that those elements mean different things. If we have very small differences, that should mean that, well, those words might actually be related. Yeah? So there's an um, idea that the summed of differences somehow reflect uh, semantic closeness or distance, but there's this one thing that I need to uh, add very quickly, um, and I'll get to this in a second. Um, this is the second step, constructing a table of frequencies with the vocabulary items and the context items and the co-occurrence frequencies. And now to the little complication, uh, we cannot simply use those raw frequencies because um, there is a problem that I will uh, explain in a second that means that the raw frequencies have actually to be transformed with a collocation measure. So what am I talking about? Um, when we compare uh, words that are low in frequency, there will be many cells uh, that have a zero. Okay? You can imagine if a word is not very frequent to begin with, uh, it won't occur with many of the context items. So we have lots of zeros further down in the table. And the difference between zero and zero is of course zero. So you have, if you have two elements that are infrequent, there are many such pairings where there's no difference. But that is not because the two elements are semantically similar, but it's because they're both infrequent. Yeah? So this, in a way, is uh, misleading to think that these two are similar just because they both have zero. Um, so what do we do? The problem is the comparison of low frequency words where uh, we might overestimate similarity just because um, there are pairs of zero or pairs of one and zero which are not that big of a difference either. So there are different solutions for this. Uh, the main <coughs> uh, approach would be that uh, we transform the raw frequencies with a collocation measure. Um, and there are many collocation measures to choose from. One that is frequently used in uh, distributional approaches is pointwise mutual information. Um, I won't bother you with the formula unless you want me to. Okay? Um, so what pointwise, information, uh, pointwise mutual information does is that it can tell you whether or not um, 20 instances of cheese in the context of goat is more than expected, less than expected, or just about as much as we would expect. Yeah? And the way this is done is uh, through the so-called marginal frequencies of the table. So we have um, in our table about 2,000 instances of goat. Yeah? That's how many examples of goat we had in our corpus. Um, as for the word cheese, um, there are about 10,000 examples of cheese in the corpus. And um, this large number here represents all the word pairings that we have represented in this table. So if you add up all of these frequencies, that is the number that uh, you, you come up with at the end. So um, from these four frequencies then, 20, 2,000, 10,000, 160 million, um, we can <clears throat> uh, compute expected frequencies for, uh, for this field. So is 20 instances more than we expect or is it less than we would expect? Um, okay, if you're like me, you can look at these numbers all day and you won't see that there's a disproportion, um, even though you maybe have an idea. But uh, if we um, <clears throat> normalize these ratios. Yeah? So 20 to 10,000 or 9,800, that's one for every 490 uh, instances of cheese. And if we compare 2,000 to 160 million, we get one to 80,000. Now, if you, if you look at this table, you can see that, well, those two ratios are not the same. Yeah? Even I can see that. Um, so that means goat cheese is definitely overrepresented. Yeah? There are many more instances of goat cheese as a combination 
than we would actually expect. And this is what uh, pointwise, info, pointwise mutual information uh, picks up on. Um, <clears throat> and it also will tell us whether a zero is significantly less than we would expect or whether this is just due to the overall low frequency of the uh, item that we're looking at. Yeah? So in a way, these collocation measures, they can neutralize the potential bias uh, that we have in the raw frequencies. All right, so that's the third step, transforming the raw frequencies with a collocation measure such as PMI. Uh, and this brings us to the fourth and final step, namely uh, text visualization. <coughs> so with a table of the sort that we have created, um, we can uh, create visualizations like this, um, where we have the elements of the watchers displayed on a two-dimensional surface according to their relative degrees of similarity to each other. Yeah? So what uh, this graph would suggest is that, for instance, uh, trousers and shirt are very, very close in terms of what elements they occur with. Yeah? And by conclusion, trousers and shirt are semantically very similar. This doesn't mean that they're synonyms. Yeah? So I wouldn't suggest that you... Uh, <clears throat> so clearly, you, you cannot wear either a pair of trousers or a shirt. They don't replace each other. Yeah? It's just that semantically, they belong very closely together to the same domain of clothing. Okay. Um, right. <clears throat> now, let's get back to the many and now construction. Um, so, in the analysis, I didn't just use a handful of uh, farm words, but I actually used the 230 most frequent noun types that I found in the, cement, uh, in the many noun construction. And um, the idea was that the semantic vector space would show um, the semantic relations between the different noun types that are frequently used in the construction. And um, in the resulting semantic vector space, you see nouns with similar meanings that are placed in close proximity to one another and nouns with different meanings that are placed relatively far away from each other. So let me show you uh, the results. <clears throat> so um, obviously this is a little more crowded than the semantic vector space for the farm words that you saw. We simply have more uh, uh, elements to do with. <coughs> And um, as I said earlier, the <clears throat> analysis is based on two data sets. We have the diachronic data, which uh, gives us frequencies that differ uh, over time, that vary over time. And we have the relative positions of the nouns, uh, and those are based on the semantic vector space that, are, that was constructed on the basis of a synchronic corpus. Um, so that means that over time, the, the meaning which is reflected in the position of the bubbles will actually be held constant, so the bubbles won't start to move, uh, but they might become bigger or smaller, yeah? or they might even disappear, or there might be new ones that show up over time. Um, now, by itself, of course, uh, this picture doesn't mean anything. Uh, let, me, let me walk you through the different elements that you see here and uh, what they mean. So you notice that the biggest bubbles in the graph are uh, colored in red, and those are actually time nouns that are found most frequently with the construction. So the most frequent element uh, is actually time, yeah? and incidentally you also see that it is right at the center of the semantic space where the zero lines of the x-axis and the y-axis meet. Uh, and there's day, night, morning, hour. There are some seasons up there, summer and winter. And uh, I also have spring and fall. They just uh, don't show up in the earliest data. Uh, there's month and there's year. Um, OK, so that is one component of the semantic landscape, the semantic spectrum of the many noun construction. Um, let's look at the green bubbles that occupy sort of the lower half of the graph. These are the human being type 
nouns that I talked about earlier. So we have uh, man, woman, mother, girl, husband, father, friend, and here we have politician, poet, writer, merchant. Yeah, these are old, old data where merchants are uh, talked about in knights. And what you can kind of see is that there is a gradient from relatively general uh, human roles. Yeah? So someone can be a man or a woman, that's a relatively general description. If I say that someone is a writer or a merchant, you know, these professions, that's more general. And in between we have the uh, family relations like father and husband and things like that. Okay, um, so those are human beings. Uh, the blue elements on the right of the graph are body parts, like head and face and hand and heart and so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, so in the many noun construction, these typically stand metonymically for the entire person. So um, when, when I say, uh, okay, when, when you read many and I uh, shall weep or so, something like that, it'll be the people that cry. Yeah? It's, it's not just an I, an isolation crying yeah? because it's lacking the rest of the body. It's, you know, the, the rest of the body is still there. Okay. Um, right. Then in between the body parts and the human beings, there are, uh, the, there are these uh, elements that are called emotion-related uh, words. So cry, smile, Sigh, joy, laugh. So <clears throat> you could say those are verbal. Those are de-verbal nouns in this case. So many a laugh, many a cry, uh, many a groan, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, uh, what I'm interested in, of course, primarily, is how this landscape changed over time. Yeah. I already told you that the many a noun construction becomes less frequent over time. And this could have different consequences with regard to this picture. Yeah? So right now, we're looking at data from the 1800s, in the uh, first decade of the 1800s. <clears throat> and overall, there's well, less and less data uh, in, the, in the database. But this could mean different things. It could mean that all the bubbles stay there, they just become smaller. Yeah? So all bubbles could become smaller as time goes on. Uh, it could also mean that uh, some of the bubbles disappear, but others stay as large as they are. Yeah. Uh, or it could mean that um, <clears throat> some bubbles disappear, others become smaller, others stay more or less the same, so a mixture of these different developments. And as we will see, uh, what happens is really a mixture of these processes. So I would like to uh, show you the uh, development over time, starting with the time nouns. Uh, so, let me press play here. So, now we're going through the years of the uh, Corpus of Historical <coughs> American English, and we see that in the well second half of the 19th uh, century, <clears throat> um, the, the time nouns actually stay there, yeah? so they're, they're still being used. In the 20th century, they become less and less frequent. Yeah? And some of them actually disappear, but most of them stay. So today, we still have many a time, many a day, um, and even yeah, uh, somewhat idiomatic usages like many a moon, which in this case means uh, many a month. Yeah? Uh, so if you compare the sizes of the time nouns here to the time nouns initially, you see that, OK, there is a difference. But overall, the set of time nouns, the, the types, they actually uh, stay pretty much intact. Um, OK, now let's look at the body parts. Because with the body parts, uh, the story is rather different. Yeah? So here we have them in the 1800s. And um, <clears throat> as with the time nouns, there's nothing much that happens in the uh, first, first and second half of the 19th century. But then, with the onset of the 20th century, the body parts uh, slowly, but surely, disappear. Yeah? So, <clears throat> until only the immortal soul remains. <laughs> uh, coincidence? I think not. Yeah? Uh, no, no it's, it's, it's not a coincidence, because you might say that this is really a miscoding on my part. 
Um, so soul is not really a great body part when you think about it. It was more or less, it seemed a good idea at the time, but I could equally have said that soul is a kind of uh, metonymy for, for a human being. Yeah? Uh, the kind of like that, you know, man or, or husband or father. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, <coughs> it's still there. Um, but the, the crucial thing is that the body parts, they have left the construction. Yeah? So they are no longer part of the semantic spectrum, as far as we can tell in the uh, late 20th century. All right, um, let's look at the human beings. What happened to the human beings? <clears throat> the human beings are more like the time nouns than the body parts. So yes, some of them will eventually disappear yeah, as we're entering the 20th century. Uh, but you notice that even very obscure things like maiden, yeah, or um, the, the merchant stays out, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, what I found remarkable when I saw this was that the human beings actually cover a huge part of the semantic space. Yeah? So we have man here, uh, we have the more concrete um, professions like writer and student and Okay, hero is not a profession, but superhero kind of is a profession. Um, yeah, and, and, and then even odd things like maiden and fellow, which are words that nobody really uses. But this kind of reflects the, the anachronistic feel of the construction. I suppose you can get a sense of this, that you know, when, when someone uses the many a noun construction, you kind of sound old-timey and tongue-in-cheek and... Um, um, yeah, so let's say... <clears throat> When, uh, when, when I have a friend, Michael, and I say, oh yeah, last weekend, many a beer was consumed at Michael's apartment. Um, <laughs> well, uh, you, know, you kind of get the sense of how I want to sound a little bit original and funny, but at the same time anachronistic. So this is the semantic prosody or the pragmatic prosody of the construction. Um, right, but bottom line is the, the human beings, they are still in the picture and they cover a really large semantic spectrum and this is crucial for my interpretation of <laughs> uh, you know, coming back to the sausage roll why people can say things like many a sausage roll uh, even to this day um, so how is that? <clears throat> um, as I said earlier the construction does not really recede into a single semantic niche uh, and that is because we have two very general types of nouns that stay strong. So the time nouns, they stay strong, and the human being nouns, they also stay strong. And um, this has consequences, because words like time or man, they belong to the most frequent nouns in the English language. And so they are very diffuse in their collocational behavior and very uh, prolific also in their meanings. And um, on top of that, there's also you know, a sizable residue of other types that are semantically very diverse, so maiden and merchant and um, <clears throat> man and woman. So that makes it very vague, very diffuse, what this construction is semantically actually all about. And so what I think happens is that speakers experience the many and noun construction as semantically uh, virtually unrestricted. Yeah? So if we can use these very general elements, uh, there's nothing that gives us a cue as to how this construction might actually be restricted. All right, um, that's it for for this construction. Uh, I would like to come to the third part, um, namely noun participle compounds like chocolate covered whiskey soap and doctor recommended. Um, <clears throat> now, this is a construction that not really related to the uh, many a noun construction, but again, it's sort of a mirror image in that this is sort of basic English grammar. This is a construction that is very well known, very well described, uh, and you find references to it in basically all the big grammars of English that have been written. So Huddleston and Pollum, that's a common reference grammar of English. Um, they talk at length about this construction and they say, well, there are examples such as drug-related, homemade, safety-tested, uh, taxpayer-funded, and so on and so forth. 
And um, what they say is, um, well, interesting from a constructional perspective because uh, they point out that this construction, this compound construction, relates to uh, an argument structure construction, namely the passive. Yeah? So uh, here's what they have to say. Uh, these compounds generally correspond to syntactic passives with a prepositional phrase. So drug-related uh, corresponds with related to drugs. Um, homemade corresponds to made at home. Safety tested, tested for safety. And taxpayer funded, uh, funded by taxpayers, and so on and so forth. <coughs> Um, yeah, um, this raises, of course, the question: uh, How uh, does this question, uh, does this construction, in fact, relate to the passive? Um, but what I was particularly interested in was how this construction develops over time. So again, I turned to the uh, Corpus of Historical American.